Hey everybody, welcome back to the PC Perspective Podcast. We've reached episode 696. This is being recorded on October 5, 2022. I'm Sebastian Peek. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm not arbitrary. But in one month, we'll be at <laughs> Magic 700. You know, I have some, yes, we will. I think there might be some changes in store starting at episode 700. I've had something in the works for a while. I haven't told anybody. I haven't told anybody on this mm. podcast panel. Hmm. As long oh, as you haven't oh. watched the 700 Club a lot. I think, I think after 699 episodes, 700 could be the start of something brand new. Wow. I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, hopefully I'm invited. Prepare to be underwhelmed. <laughs> uh, hey, it is uh, coming up on an interesting time of the year. Should we do a uh, you know a Halloween theme show? No, as the time nears, I think it'd be great. Uh, I have a little. Remember, we what? did last year. We did one last year where we had this whole like Doom theme and. Oh yeah, that's right. I had a CRT yeah. with uh, Doom sitting yes. next to me. Yes, we did a whole from hell. I made a, a Josh intro where it was like a spinning head that kept on switching mm-hmm. between Josh and Nick Cage <laughs> over a red background you with like shrieking you could, wings. You mm-hmm. could hardly tell the difference. <laughs> it's episode 666 of the PC Respective Podcast. Let's move to Josh's burger segment or food segment. I don't know if it's burgers or not. Josh, you tell us. Well, I guess it's a burger, but this one is uh, it was unique. I've I've never kind of mixed meats like this before. I know that sounds bad, but once you understand, you'll understand. But this is the cheesy horror. Not cheesy horror, but cheesy horror. It's a single patty topped with white American cheese, chicken tenders, uh, tossed in their mild buffalo sauce, mac and cheese, and finally a little bit of Thousand Island dressing, which you can kind of see a little bit under the uh, bottom bun or above the bottom bun. And it, it only fourteen ninety nine. Yeah, mm-hmm. this was this was super cheesy. Who would have thought mac and cheese and chicken tenders? With a mild buffalo wing sauce. I probably should have had him toss it in the hot, but I didn't. Let me tell you, that was a meal. That was a meal, and I'm still feeling it. And, yeah, I don't feel like eating anytime soon. So, just as your wife had that large Reuben, or whatever it was. Ooh, look at the detail on those fries. Ooh, good detail. Yeah, this... uh the fries were actually done really, really well this time. Is that black Not too pepper? Soggy. Yeah. On the fries? Looks good. Yeah. Yeah. I see a hint of a seed there. Hmm? Well, that's from the, uh, that's it, I think from the uh, pepper sauce, because they make uh, oh, their own better. sauces themselves. So, yeah. The uh, cheesy horror was, it lived up to its name, I guess. I don't know. It wasn't a horror. It was, it was wonderful. And I'd have it again, but not anytime soon. It's there's just too cheap. Mad, there's a mad genius working at that restaurant. Yes, Madness. There is. Okay, one more time for clarification. Were you saying whore or horror? Horror. Okay. Not a whore. Horror. All right. Before you move on to actual stories, we need to just thank our patrons. That's right. Patreon.com slash PC per you can become part of an elite unit of uh, very loyal fans to keep us going. Do we have any news on that front? You know, we do. We have uh, one biker, Chris, who uh, actually uh, um, did a little bit more on his pledge. We really appreciate that biker, Chris. So thanks so much for thanks, continuing biker, Chris. To the show. Yeah. Way to go, man. And um, I guess this is Baza Sammy Note 2. I'm not sure if his if his patron account was automatically insistently named after his Samsung device. You know, I really don't know whether that's a, like an autofill sort of thing or, you know, no, how that see, really I don't works. think the whole world works like Apple where it would be sent from my oh, iPhone no matter what you do. 
Well, so, then I don't know how it happened. Sent from my but that's, Sammy Note 2. Sammy Although, to be fair, Note 2. I do make that the auto signature on all my Samsung devices is sent from my iPhone. <laughs> it confuses a lot nice. of people. Nice. Do you register all your Windows well, installs to Stephen P. Jobs? Hmm. It's, a, it's a thought. Yeah. But no, hey. it's Mike Rowe Soft. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, go, going away from the Patreon, thank you, Baza. Or thank Baz, you guys. Baza. 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 Yes, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate thank it. You. Shall we delve into some Intel Arc coverage? I mean, we've we've had you know a field day talking about Arc for months now. We love this segment. Listeners love the segment. We get, we get hundreds of emails a week. Uh, we tend telling us to stop. <laughs> begging us yeah. for more Arc coverage. <laughs> um, in my mind. It's... This is day 412 of continuous art coverage, by yeah, the way. It's, it's been the lead story <laughs> yeah. for as long as I can remember. I think before my son was born, we started talking about ARC. And he's, mm. he's in first grade, mm-hmm. so it's been a while. Mm-hmm. But uh, we didn't get sampled, so uh, I don't have the ARC limited edition cards to uh, show off. But we can go to other websites like Kit Guru, which... Uh, Right off the bat, they do a rating system like Anantec did way back in the day before, you know, industry pressure forced that to go away. And it's a 5.5 out of 10. That uh, seems a little underwhelming. Yes, seems a little harsh. So I've seen some very positive press today. This is not one Uh of them. So, of course, the A770 and the A750 limited edition cards are what are featured here. That's what we're sent out to select reviewers. And the 770, of course, the limited edition is the 16 gigabyte version. Now we've talked about these. You for only this, $349. That's a great price. Yeah. Even if you don't use it for gaming, like we've talked about with, even with the A380, if you're just using this for the AV1 and desktop productivity and four monitors, it's not a bad deal. But, uh, uh, you know, people just care about gaming performance. So let's look at some gaming. Uh, where do you think that starts here? I don't see a drop down. Here we go. Test methodology. Okay, so synthetics, we already know that it does well in synthetics. Astonishingly well, really. It almost looks like well, it's there was mistake, this, but yeah. Yeah, it's optimized for them. I mean, when they optimize the drivers for a title, it does well. The problem is when they don't optimize for a title, how well does that do? And that's what, that's where the... uh, Rubber hits the road? Yeah, that's where the less enthusiastic reviews, looking at DX11 performance and performance with uh, games that are not especially well optimized for. So Cyberpunk, Hmm. here it is at 1080 Ultra. It's pretty brave. And we have just above a 2060 level performance... For average FPS, while the 1% lows are below that level. It's interesting. I, I've seen other charts that have them a little bit stronger on this title. Maybe the testing scenario was different. You never know with Cyberpunk. I've been well, fighting and they're all using day. An, they're using an Intel system. Most of the other links we're going to do are on an AMD system, which you should uh, bear in mind okay. for later on. That is interesting. And I will say, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, the whole rebar oh. versus not rebar yes. Intel yes. AMD. So there's a lot of there's a lot to take in. I'm not going to go. You know, through. I didn't realize that the uh, the 6600 was that strong against the 3060. I always thought oh, that yeah. the 3060 was you know a faster. But no, that's that's uh, boy. You know, if I were to buy one now, I'd definitely look at a 6600 XT for. Somebody, but that's not here. Well, it's it's part of this, but it's not our main goal. But, to, okay, but but you can see these are solidly mid range cards, and and perhaps with driver tuning, uh, it's going to be very respectable. Yeah, here is uh, Far Cry Six. It, this is DX12, so it's uh, 1080 Ultra HD textures are enabled, and we have the A770 and the A750 uh, kind of bookending the 6600. So just below and just above the performance of a 6600. So right in that neighborhood, but below the level of a 6600 XT. But say goodbye to the 3060. 
well, by yeah, I know it's fair. It's six or seven frames per second, but yeah, it's margin it, of error. Yeah, it's well, actually no. I'm looking at the one percent lows. The average is it's about one frame per second faster. That would be the A750 versus the 3060, and then yeah, seven frames beyond that for the 770. <laughs> A lot is lost in the audio version of this. I don't know how exciting it is to listen to a podcast where people <laughs> sort of comment on charts that you can't see. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Hold on. It, uh, they're not terribly performing cards for a, a mid-range. As even cranking up some of the detail levels or you know the arbitrary mm-hmm. high, medium, and low scales on uh, demanding titles like Cyberpunk 2077 can get you you know mid mid fifty plus mm-hmm. frames per second on the high end card. I like how, comparatively speaking, the performance gets better the higher resolution you get. Like, as 1080p cards, these are kind of embarrassing, but once you hit 1440, they do match up with the price competitors fairly well, which is kind of nice to see. They have a Did lot of memory. Did you guys look at any... Well, this 16 gig has a lot of memory, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What... Did, did you see any of, the, um, of their performance on Ray Trace titles, or Ray Trace Gaming? I yeah. saw a couple surprisingly Decent. good much better than amd's first swing i mm-hmm. have to say just to give you a visual if you're watching this on dx11 versus dx12 here is uh, an a770 tested with games that offer both apis so battlefield 5 with dx11 and the dx12 dx11 at uh, 1080 ultra or max settings 92 frames per second, and in DX12 mode, it goes up to 137.7. Control goes from 90 to 107. Rainbow Six Siege goes from 161 to 263. It gains 100 frames per second by going from DX11 to Vulcan. That's probably the most extreme example, but you definitely can tell that the drivers have been tuned for DX12 and Vulcan, and not so much uh, DX11. And there's other articles about that. It's, it's, in this one, they call it the DX11 problem. And there was a list in the PC World review of just different issues encountered. It's, mm-hmm. it's early days, obviously, but the cons listed at PC World are lacking performance in DX11 games, bad performance without rebar. Well, yeah, we, we were warned yeah. about yeah. that. But they, they, software, they came out and said that. And then XCSS works well, but only a handful of games. But right, that's early days for that, too. Well, and to be fair, it works on NVIDIA and AMD, too, which is kind of neat. That is true. So the hardware, I mean, it it has potential. We're just waiting on, you know, the endless work on drivers. And, of course, every new title coming out will have to have a new driver update. And I don't know. They don't have the, uh, the years and years of... DX11 driver support. That's mentioned DX9, no. 10, 11. Yeah. Heck, let's run a DX8 game. All right. Why not? Just not on a NARC. Morrowind, here I come. <laughs> you know, buy a card that's two generations old if that's, if that's your jam. Why? Suddenly. They cost as much as the new one does. Now, I, yeah. I don't usually put a benchmark as my uh, heading picture, but I think this tells a story of driver support right here. The inconsistency in performance is insane. Most of these, yes, we always do see a bit of a California smile with some titles preferring architecture better than others, but it's not anywhere near to the extent that what Tech Power Up was seeing with that 770. It's crazy. Like Warhammer 3, very, very visually demanding game, right? Can't make 60 frames a second average. Doom Eternal? Hey, do you want to go about 170? No problems. So I thought that just sort of was a very quick overview of what some of the issues people are describing with the, the drivers, other than, you know, the occasional people running into blue screens and visual tearing or weird artifacts or such. But I just, you know, the hardware is definitely there, but they, just the bouncing and performance is crazy. 
Um, yeah, they're having uh, some issues with switching, doing mode switching, you know, when you get into like 3D rendering, high speed, a lot of deep pipelines, mm -hmm. and then switching back to like 2D generation, sort of desktop utility graphics. They're having trouble, you know, making that switch as well. Resolution changing on the fly changes, things like that. Hmm. It's unfortunate. So but frequency software, switching, fixable. you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the performance numbers that you've <clears> seen <throat> out there, I'd be curious if anybody wants to comment on the likelihood of a ARC purchase because pricing does seem great. And if you trust Intel and you trust that they're going to continue working on the drivers and that you're going to see continuous updates with, obviously they've just had a whole bunch of independent testing done where we have copious notes and they can work with the reviewers on issues they've encountered if if they want to you know put them in touch with somebody from the driver team and maybe like we saw after that uh, gamers nexus look a while back at arc which resulted in a bunch of fixes in the mm -hmm. next driver update maybe we'll start to see more consistent results and some of these issues addressed but if if they're going to remain available for three forty nine for a card like the seven seventy with sixteen gigs of memory, that is uh, very impressive. Even if you're just using it for GP GPU stuff, I I need to find a review that covers that because that's really what I want. I've, to do I've seen some numbers and uh, the, it's it's impressive uh, across a wide variety of of uh, open uh, CL and GP GPU stuff. Um, actually, kind of outruns everything else, and it's it's class. Mm. So. You know, it's it's Intel has got a lot of very talented engineers, and uh, they probably have some of the best compiler guys around. Period. And so eventually, you know, these drivers are going to improve, and I think the hardware by itself is pretty solid. It doesn't have really any big pitfalls that I've noticed. Though I really wish somebody would get out and do some some serious frame time type work on it. I mean, I'm assuming in, in most of the DX12 and Vulcan titles, uh, it's going to be pretty consistent. I think their their workflow is, is not, you know, patched together with all these XC units. Um, yeah, but GP GPU stuff really flies, and you've got a 16 gig local memory. Uh, so everything I've heard, and, and they've done some pretty significant driver improvements over the past two months uh, when it comes to the GP GPU stuff. So, you know, we've got, you know, some good possibilities out there if this is what you do. And, uh, you know, they're going to work with other guys like Adobe and the other, you know, bad software makers uh, to, uh, to accelerate this stuff and, and they've got the ability to do it. So, I think it's it's only going to get better news throughout the rest of the year as they introduce fixes, do shader replacements, improve the real-time compilers, all that stuff. And, I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see what they learn for Battle Mage. That could be very interesting or a Bethesda release. Hard to say which. So I move past the riveting arc discussion to something else. Well, riveting. Only only one one last thing is that for non ray trace stuff, my hot take has always been, but I already own a ten eighty Ti. Oh brother. Okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a ten eighty Ti will remain one of the greatest DX eleven graphics accelerators of all time, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes it yes it will. <laughs> okay. Well one of the things that I've explored as we continue our Ryzen 7000 coverage, is the the phenomenon of, you know, certain people who have observed that if you lower the voltage in your BIOS and combining this with a power limit of 125 watts, say, you can get your 7950X to run even faster and at delitted temps. Now, this is accomplished by going into Precision Boost Overdrive. You have to set it to Advanced, as you're going to see here. And then when that is set, you can go into the Curve Optimizer 
and I have this set to all cores. I have a negative optimized uh, offset here, and then the magnitude, as it's called here, is 30, which is the max. Now, this is something I got from an Optimum Tech video we mentioned last week, and it's, it's pretty remarkable how without any additional work, just these two settings, I was able to see more than a 20 degree drop in temperatures. And not only did performance not regress, but it actually increased slightly. Hmm. This did not work for every CPU. Uh, I did a stream the other day where I put in the 7900X, tried the same thing, and immediately started getting the system, you know, system lockups, uh, trying to run Blender, it was totally unstable. Had to hard reset the system a couple of times, so I, I just I just want to point out that that was a completely ad hoc uh, stream on your part, and you just decided to go think like other people might actually enjoy this right now. I Let's don't know if you know the best part of that stream. Do you want to know the absolute best part? Yeah, which you which didn't part? drop a glass case side, <laughs> and you didn't knock over a motherboard that soon after stopped working. Yeah, it's true. Josh, I also saw, based upon the camera angle, I saw a remarkably disturbing number of things held over the unshielded socket. Yeah, there was some comments like, be careful. So I said, well, you mean like this? And I wanted to, I almost grabbed a screwdriver and dangled it over the uh, LJ <laughs> yeah. pants. I was just asking for <laughs> Asking for I, trouble. I, I saw I saw like a chain of things going over the top of the socket as you were like gesturing with stuff and things were like being fumbled about and I'm like, oh my god, he's gonna drop it right on the pins. <laughs> anyway, uh yeah, the stream basically looked like this because this was some of the capture work that I'd done beforehand, thinking, you know, hey, why don't I do like a video on the how successful this is with the 7950X? And I can run, you know, these benchmarks and, and, you know, show you the low temperatures that still, you know, the high performance. I mean, this Cinebench R23 run, 38,483 points, and this is not overclocked. Mm. That's smoking. That is very high. Stock, it was like 38,200. So we're getting a higher score. But then the package power... I mean, we're limited to 165 watts now. We weren't hitting anywhere near the 200-something that it normally does. Yeah. That's and not 95 Celsius. No, look at that. Maximum, it hits 69 degrees. Nice. So it's a, it's a, this is amazing. Why isn't everybody doing this? <laughs> Forget all these concerns about the thickness of the IHS. 69 package. Just, well, yeah. Okay. Hot. All right. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of thick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I'm really me. just a 12 year old boy. That is, <laughs> that is reached puberty ish. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm watching my video here. This is run number two. This is a blender run this time, which of course will take longer than a quick Cinebench R23 run. But here we are, maximum. It's creeping up, but it's still below 70. C. I think the most I saw out of any of these runs was like 71. And That's we have the voltage temperature. Voltage holding steady at 1.250. Now, what was interesting about the 7900X uh, was that when I started doing the same stuff with that processor, the voltages overall were higher than the 7950X, just stock. And then when I did the negative offset, of course, it was still higher because it was an offset of a higher number. And then it wasn't stable, so I had to back off on this and... I think the consensus from the stream was uh, the 7950X is just a better bend part because you have you have to have all eight uh, cores working on each CCD and you have to have the highest clocks out of the box. It has the highest boost clocks. So it's just, it seemed, I don't know if it's just because we got a good sample because these were AMD provided samples. Is, is it possible that they've, they've, try to send out golden samples to media or is it just that the 7950x can do this but good luck if the other ones do any thoughts about this <clears throat> i'm glad you got a good ship hmm. it'll be fun it's a good ship lollipop 
I mean, it's, it's a good ship even without gold. Chip. Even without gold Sugar samples, drop. it's a it's a good ship. <sighs> Could run a little cooler. Everybody thinks, even though AMD says, "Oh no, ninety five C is fine. That's just that's fine." Can I bring something yeah. else up here on this forum? What's that? CPU Z or CPU ID, whatever. Mm-hmm. Here it is yeah, lined up, you. and you can see just for a moment there it showed bus speed was one one hundred megahertz, and it kind of fluctuates like ninety nine point nine two is what it's showing right yeah. now. And the memory, which was 6,000 CL30, it's showing the correct frequency is 3,000. Now, th- that is what I get from CPU-Z. Even running the latest build of Hardware Info 64, it was showing me a bus speed of 94.4. Sometimes I get sure 95.3. I've had it as low as 91. So then it shows that my core clocks are lower than they are. And it shows me that my memory is lower than it is. So I don't yeah. know... Who to believe here? Is it CPU? You got to get out the oscilloscope. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start counting them waves. Pin, pin probes. Uh, it, it looks like Hardware Info 64 has some catching up to do with uh, querying certain mm. registers. Isn't it kind of cool, though, that, that we still have people who are willing to do the grunt work and the testing mm-hmm. so that we all can, you know, profit? from such things greatly yes. greatly benefit yes mm-hmm. yeah and look here's uh here's a blender run and you can see the clocks this thing is over 5.1 gigahertz on an all-core load sustained like this this had been going for a minute and a half at this point i don't think i ever saw clocks lower than an average of one uh, of, of like 5.1 because there, there'll be clocks of like 5.2, whatever this is. This is just the average core speed. Oh, no, it actually says core zero. So I, don't, eh, I think when I looked at hardware info, it was showing me averages. But but look at that core voltage. This says it's only at 1.10 right now under all core load. 1.12. Mm, 1.1, it's just 1, sipping. 2. Very, very well behaved, very efficient chip. Not drawing very much power. And by the way... This system uh, here, this is the X670E system with the 7950X in it. It is the new graphics test bed. I thought, hey, you know, uh, why not? Just You're going to have on. a lot of fun over this next week. Oh, yeah. The mm-hmm. fun. And, and you know why? You know why, Josh? I do know why. Because even though Intel did not send us the ARC reviewers kit I, you know i could get those cards myself eventually but what about that light that I neon know. light that's the arc light. light get it yeah uh, oh god is that available for purchase no it's not it's only the le it's the le yeah. does it come with the le or was it part of the reviewers kit hmm i think it's the limited edition but i'm not don't quote me on that i do know that no, they need no, next it's, USB it's plug the, for it it's the reviewer's kit. Come on. Uh, okay. Get with it now. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Don't we know somebody we can call there? Don't we? No. I've... No, he um, went to SK Hynix. Yeah. Um, don't, we, don't we know somebody else? <laughs> 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 I've already done some nagging. Don't worry. I tried to go through so maybe, the channel. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, bag. if they don't sell as much as they think, maybe they'll pull an AMD. Like with the um, the walnut boxes, the walnut rising Ooh. boxes, oh, actually sell okay. them by themselves. Okay. I just hey I Ryan, if you're watching, one. I just hook me up, hook a brother up with one of those sweet arc lights, and throw in a GPU or two. With, you know, if you feel like it too. Yeah. Nice. But we'll definitely review the light. Now speaking of <laughs> GPUs, cards like this now. There was a time when I thought, man, this design is it's the timeless. Pinnacle. Is amazing. This, You're thinking it's timeless. Yeah, this 2080 Ti would look so modern and, and sleek. And now it's kind of a vintage look. It's just looking at a, a classic mm. car. This looks quite dated by by now. And it's been just a couple short I think this came out in what, 2018 or something? Do you know one that does not still look dated? The GTX 680. That still looks like a pretty sharp card. 
The 680? Which one? The, the, the plastic shrouded blower design? Yeah, but it's, you know, they called it some other kind of, you know, high tensile strength. Are uh, you sure you're not thinking of the 690? Because that's when they went to that cool modern design with the, the window yeah, maybe it was. and the silver. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it was the 690. All the fake the carbon fiber looking stuff. That was that was the one I had up on the screen here. That For, one episode that was 690. 690. For episode 690. For episode 690. Yeah. Nice right, callback. Well, anyway. Yeah, anyway, uh, bigger than that card and sporting the latest in graphics card aesthetics and industrial is design choices is the... What do you have there? This is it's the 4090. And, How do you uh, even lift it? Do you have to use two hands? You know, I weighed this thing when I got it, and I'm going to weigh it again for you right now because on this desk is a Amazon special... Uh, Digital scale. Why tear do you that keep a thing. scale on your desk. Why do you keep a hey, scale? Tear on your it desk? before you. For the, I did an unboxing video of this. That's been that's not been seen by anyone. Okay. Now I don't think you can actually see this. Nope. It just says ERR, doesn't it? <laughs> it <says> ERR. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> can't see. Can't see. Can't see. Yeah, Why is this light so infernally bright? It's no. Uh, it's too. too it's about five pounds. It's four pounds, 15 ounces. How, how much does the cat of nine tails weigh? Now, now throw the, wait, don't put that away yet. Throw what? that old 2080 Ti on there. Do you have a 20, that, was that what that was? A 2080 Ti? Right? Oh, this is like three pounds. It's, that's not even close. But yeah. okay. if you, just for a size comparison. That's good. I mean. That's it's girthy. A, it's, it's, a yeah, very, it's, that's... it's a very thick card. It is not. It is not four slots though. Like the some of those aftermarket designs are absolutely nuts. If you saw Dr. Bauer's video this morning, he has a I think it's a gigabyte card that looks like that Lenovo thing we've been talking about. That looked like it basically took up four slots. It was really only three in the end, but the length of the card is just insane. And I've seen some memes about this already, like the giant size. It's actually a little bit shorter <clears throat> than the thirty ninety founders edition. But it is a little bit thicker. But we're not talking about major difference in overall size compared to the 3090 Founders Edition, from what I've seen. I never had a 3090 Founders Edition. But it's it's making your hands look small. This is this is not that big of a card. You want a big card? Get one of those Supreme cards from MSI from the 3090s. That is true. I happen to have one right here, and the Supreme is physically larger. It's about an inch or so longer, maybe more. And even though it has a two-slot backplate, the fan shroud is another slot. So it's still triple slot. It's taller. So yeah, uh, the most important part of our uh, 4090 sample is, of course, the incredible four PCI Express 8-pin to one tiny next-gen PCIe connector. With with no sense. No sense leads. No, it does. Well, I mean, two. But it, they're not it's connected nonsense. to anything. Well, two of them aren't, and two of them are. So your Bauer was taking his apart, which mm. you know, he was told not to take the card apart, so then he took apart the adapter. Uh, Funny. Yeah. Anyway. Can't wait for more on that. Can't talk about performance or anything, so we will just move on. A little confused by the title of this next story, Jeremy. Please explain. How could the Deep Cool LS720 360? And by the way, why is it called 720 if it's a 360? Anyway, how does it like <laughs> AMD better? Just is it a, a Team Red fan, I, like a card carrying member of the Team Red fan club? I mean, you might think so from the results, uh, because for whatever reason, and I mean, it it's not that it has a, a weird adapter to use for uh, like an LGA 2011 or something. And it will fit a thread ripper, but for whatever reason in the testing that they did on the AMD system, which is a Ryzen 9 3900X, which is, you know, a fairly toasty chip versus uh, the Intel, which was a i9 10900K. I mean, it just did significantly better overall cooling AMD. It, it ran quieter, it 
ran better temperatures. It went from on the Intel side, sort of a mediocre middle of the road uh, benchmarked results to with AMD pretty damn good, uh, especially when you consider the price. So it was it it, it was a little odd. Well, uh, just Tech this test was never really good. Th- it's a 3900. It wasn't Ryzen 7000, by the way. Well, no. Yeah. I do notice that right. this lists AM5 compatibility for the mounting hardware, so I was curious about the backplate. But Right, yes. Obviously, they're using a, a Zen 2 processor with this. But, I mean, even if it is a 3900X, Zen 2, I mean, these are, what, 105-watt processors? So, <laughs> not surprised that... Let's see, what was their Intel system? Oh, yeah, 10900K. That is a, a warm chip it's a warmer chip yes so what you're saying is that uh when presented with a greater thermal load the temperatures were higher correct and the noise created was significantly louder why don't we assume that they just noted that the differential wasn't as high rather than the the absolute differential is kind of (laughs) and i mean they Tech Power Up is one of the guys that just does. They they keep every single benchmark. I know. I'm done. scrolling and scrolling and scrolling <laughs> and scrolling, and I'm still on the same chart. You must be I'm tired. Getting lost here. But yeah, here we go. Here we here we get into the. Are these are these deltas? Because that would be very high. That's, that's no, seventy four degrees. No, measured. can't be. Okay, let's see. Yeah, ninety five uh, degree delta. Yes, that's perfectly fine. Okay, who who is putting a Pure Rock Two FX on a, a 10900K without power limits? That is just that's just rude. And the nice thing is, it's 140 bucks and got a five year warranty on it. So overall, relatively decent pick. Hey, speaking of cooling, what what is the other cooling? The there's Peltier. Is that how it's pronounced? Peltier. Peltier. What other type of solid state cooling is there to confuse people who are not very uh, engineering minded? <laughs> well, uh, like the subtitle says, it's uh, very cool and very hard to describe. Uh, this is a, a rather interesting pers- perscovite, uh, which some researchers found out, which is like a manganese, manganese tin and carbon uh, composite. And they figured out that if they run a tiny bit of electricity through it, it drops temperatures by up to 0.57 Kelvin per square centimeter uh, quite happily. Just removes it. Uh, And it it doesn't seem to matter if it's a positive charge or a negative charge. If you apply uh, apply an electric field to it, it just immediately drops in temperature and will quite happily move heat away from anything it's touching to maintain that temperature. And to make everything even more bizarre, they figured out that if they actually went for a more, if they made it a stronger magnetic field than electric field, it rises in temperature by the exact same amount. They ain't quite sure how that works, but they're working on it. But the thing is that, I mean, we've, if you've run into Peltier coolers before, they're neat in that all it takes is a little tiny dribble of electricity and it will move heat from one side of it to the other. So from a heat producing chip to a heat sink but they're not terribly effective like they the amount of heat they move is not very much and there's there, you, you quickly run against a, a point where you know no matter how much more energy or how much bigger you make the Peltier it's the, the the returns decline to the point where there's no point in doing it now there's been a couple of other solid state cooling devices which have required you know a fairly uh, large magnetic field like a a good chunk of Tesla's here. Not a good thing to put into a PC or anywhere near sensitive electronics, but you know, for a refrigerator or something, not so bad. But the neat thing with this is that it's, it's, I mean, obviously for cooling computers and moving heat away from a hot object is one good thing. But the other thing is that this could scale up because it's, it's denser. It's heat movement is denser than like a, your standard compressor, style refrigeration unit and it barely needs any voltage whatsoever to do it and apparently refrigeration takes a huge chunk of the world's electricity budget every single day so they can figure out how to do this you can get rid of your motor your evaporation chamber your compressor and just have something that trickle charges in and maintains a perfectly 
measurable linear temperature. It doesn't keep getting colder. It just hits that temperature and stays there. What if so IHSs were made out of this material? I mean, sort of, that's the thought. Hmm. You'd still need a way to move the heat, the excess heat from that to another object. But at the same time, just the fact that the trickle charge is maintaining it at a certain temperature below what its normal resting temperature is, is very interesting. There's a lot of neat physics. If you can follow that sort of thing, uh, click the link on Physics World. They actually go through to uh, the published paper and that sort of thing. Because it, it's it's bloody hard to describe unless you fully understand the science, which I'm not even going to pretend that I do. I just know enough that this is actually pretty freaky and neat. And Sebastian got so bored with all the physics. That I he's... was trying to follow, and I'm scrolling through the article. and just I, Oh, yeah. good luck. And in good the luck. back of his head, he's, he's singing, I think you freaky and I like you a lot. <laughs> Oh, I'm not the only one with that going through the back of my head. Let's pause here for a word from this week's podcast sponsor. Guys, it's no secret that women can love a nice beard and that we love growing them, or at least trying. But having a great looking beard requires work. Whether it's beard oils, styling products, or even a top of the line trimmer, there's a small army of products seemingly required to grow your best beard. Luckily, there's Beard Club. As the leader in beard first men's growth and grooming, Beard Club delivers quality hardware and consumables that'll help you grow a better, thicker, and fuller looking beard. I recently had a chance to use the Beard Club Trimmer Deluxe Kit over the past couple of weeks. The PT45 trimmer itself has an adjustable depth cutter, an additional numbered plastic clips, and sand offs. So getting dialed in was trivial. It's a super nice and truly hefty trimmer and for me i'm getting a sweet repeatable trim at different depths no hair pulling and has an awesome battery life like i said it's super nice the kit also comes with plenty of other beard upgrades too i didn't even know how pleasant sandalwood beard balm or shampoo was i expect you won't be disappointed with how good your face and beard will feel either so head over to beardclub.com slash pc per take the beard quiz and use our code pc per checkout they'll be able to dial in a grooming kit recommendation just for you no matter what type of beard you have beard club has the perfect kit to fit your needs in tech gear speak go up Upgrade your Beard Care OS. Grow your best beard today and take 20% off your first order when you go to beardclub.com slash PCPer and use our code PCPer. That's beardclub.com slash PCPer. Code PCPer. And get 20% off your first order. We're back and we're going to talk about how we could be one step closer to the PlayStation 5 jailbreak we've all been clamoring for. Yes, after two years, you still can't buy one, but if you get one somehow, you might be able to jailbreak it sometimes sort of yeah tell me more it's a it's a first step so it's an exploit on one of the older firmwares where uh someone actually managed to figure out how to set up a race condition uh at boot where it could actually give you the ability to read and write to certain chunks that you've never been able to before PS5 is pretty good. Like it's been years and we still haven't got complete jailbreak out of it, but the ability to read and write to large chunks of Simpson memory is a huge step forward. You still can't run arbitrary code on it, but the ability to read and write means that you can now get it to at least accept stuff that you add to it. And eventually, you know, we'll be able to get it to, uh, to write, to uh, run stuff we want it to. Was this using older, like, PS4 save game? I, am I remembering something else? I'm just remembering the exploit mechanism that they used. Um, so it was an older version of the thing, but when it boots, uh, they just sort of talk about, like, I didn't dig deep, deep into the person who did it, Spectre Dev, uh, who's apparently very famous among jailbreaking co- consoles. But uh, yeah, it was it was something that happened uh, towards the beginning of the boot where you could actually mm-hmm. get it to all of a sudden you, you'd you'd have uh, it'd leave a hook open which you could then use to write to. Obvious reasons they're probably not uh, spelling everything out quite yet on anywhere that they can be traced back by uh, Sony. Fair enough. <clears throat> have you joined Stadia yet? <laughs> oh, I, there's still time. The only thing, <laughs> there's still time. <laughs> there's still time. 
The only thing I'm confused about with this Stadia story is that this is news, or that it hadn't already happened. For some reason, I thought it already happened. <laughs> like, wait, now they're like, actually really killing it? Because the last yes, time this was news, news then Google came out and said, oh, no, 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 we're not gonna, we're not killing this. We're not, we're not shutting it down. We're, we're supporting it. Like, and it's official yes. now. They're, they're, they're yeah. shutting it down. They're giving people refunds. It's over. Get over yeah. it. News of, yeah, news of my demise. Yeah. <laughs> They're not refunding the games that they had to buy to run on Ooh. No. Stadia, right? Uh, yeah. Because hey, they ended up giving gosh. me some sort of uh, Stadia subscription. So I would I'd get emails every month about, hey, these are the five or eight new games that you should totally try out. And the tone of the emails over the years went from, hey, we're awesome. You should try to, please, could you like at least log in so that we can say that there was an active user on it? Please? <laughs> please? <laughs> Josh, my understanding is that some of the publishers found out from the uh, news announcement that that the site was uh, system was shutting down, and some of mm-hmm. them were Stadia exclusive, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or some of their titles were were Stadia exclusive. I should say, not that the publisher was. Man, November twenty nineteen. I forgot it was that long ago. They almost made it to three, three years <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost. And if we if we add back in the negative latency, it would be three years, right? Yeah. Let's move on. Move. Let's let's go through these quick. Gaming quick hits. They better be quick. Forever Skies. Coming hey, soon. it's Subnautica in a post-apocalyptic Earth that's had an ecological uh, disaster, and you're flying an airship instead of being underwater. And oh, there is a this. demo on Steam right now, which you can grab. Uh, I think it's like a limited like 20 minute or 30 minutes of play as opposed to a limited uh, area of the game. So, hey, give it a shot. It looks interesting. Uh, apocalyptic uh, sky-based Subnautica. I, I'm all about this. Yeah. I, I'm going to go download this yeah, one. Same crafting, except you're upgrading instead of a hab, you're upgrading your airship. And it's the same sort of deal that you find out the backstory, apparently, by uh, scanning data pads and finding corpses. Lovely yep. Forever thing. Skies. Forever Skies. Go check it out. Moving on. Next up is, of course, a humble bundle because it's Brad. <laughs> and, you know, that's what he yes. does. Baldur's Gate and beyond. And beyond. Look at all of these games. Look at them all. What's and the beyond? There's Neverwinter Nights. Uh, there's a Beam Dog Enhanced Edition ones. Siege of Dragon, I'll, Spear, and uh, the other one are okay. Faces of course, I've evil. never heard of. But Icewind Dale, that's going to be good. Uh, Planes, uh, the Planescape Torment Enhanced Edition. These are all going to be good games. For 25 bucks, stock up if you like this genre. Nice. What is next? Hold on. What is this? Oh, Weird West. We've talked about Weird West before. Yeah. So if you haven't bought it, you can get the Bounty Hunter Journey for free, which they're saying is about five hours of gameplay. And of course, if you buy the game, you you get it as well uh, as an add-in. But uh, that's pretty, you know, ballsy to give about what they're saying is five hours worth of gameplay for free. You know, it's brilliant is what it is. That's the yeah. that's the magic and beauty of the demos because you, mm-hmm. you can download it, install it, see if your system can support it properly, and then you can play it, and if you like it, you buy it. Yep. Like, Do you like, like Defense Grid back in the day. Yep. <laughs> Defense Grid, yeah. DG1. Wait, isn't that an NVIDIA this product? one? This one yeah. I just picked up of of Discord news, and it was just it just too historical to ignore. And you got to scroll down to the numbers when you get there. Okay, hold on. Beyond Good and Evil Two overtakes Guinness record holder Duke Nukem Forever is the game longest in development. I saw this. Uh, I don't think it's ever coming out, people. No. But they continuously say they are working on it. They even held big splashes at E3 in as recently as 2000, uh, 2020. They had a big announcement at E3 uh, where they talked about it. Was there an E3 in 2020? I guess there maybe a digital one. Well, there was a, a virtual one. E3. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. okay. The yeah. VE3. See, that's pretty brave yeah, of them to announce continued development at the virtual yeah. E3. For a virtual yes. game, 
in virtual development. Well, let's look at the numbers here real quick from the number of days. It's like 5,126 days or 5,156 days for Duke Nukem Forever. Yeah. And Beyond Good and Evil 2 has now surpassed that by a significant amount at at least yeah. 5,235 days. Well, you know what after, this means? After this Beyond many Good years, and Evil learned... Oh, sorry, Sebastian, go ahead. No, that's fine. After the, this many years, how many game engines has it... Has it gone through how many I, i'm not i'm not sure they'll ever catch up you know it's gone through eight versions of unity is what it's done uh but no they've learned something because the absolute worst thing that duke nukem forever actually did was release itself that's true hmm. it was always so it's, I, sometimes anticipation God. is better than the actual uh, act exactly itself. You know? uh this is a, actually a screenshot from beyond good and evil too oh, or beyond okay. good and evil yeah. i should hold say on, hold on. Yeah. No, 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 no need. Yeah, Camera no. one. This is this That's is a one. beyond. This is beyond good and evil. A couple of screenshots from from them. So well, that it was, was a good game. Homage. Yeah. <sighs> Next, they'll release black and white too, and it'll be even worse. <laughs> it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Part, Peter Molyneux <laughs> has <laughs> never <laughs> produced a bad game. Come on, <laughs> ever. Uh... It's time for Security Corner, featuring uh, this story from the register, Atlassian and Microsoft Bugs. A usual CISAs, victim. Much, <laughs> uh, I can't read. All right, must. It, it says hat. It says, so it says humble, must, not much. Humble, else read this humble one. bumble. Humble bumble. <laughs> Atlassian's humble bumble. <laughs> How do you pronounce CISA, by the way? Is it CISA? Or does it not? I would have say CISA. I would say I would say CISA. CISA. Cybersecurity CISA. Kissa. and Infrastructure Security Alliance. Kissa. Kissa. Ma, uh, <laughs> CISA. Oh my gosh! Kissa He's ma, such a twelve. He's a twelve-year-old at this Jeremy, time of night. Please uh, take this from the top. Oh, this isn't my fault. This was uh, Brett's fault. It is, but Brett, it's one you, of your links. You take this. You take ownership of this. It is. It is a link. It seems that Atlassian's GitHub servers are are sus are susceptible to an API exploit, which allows total ownership of, uh, of Git hosts, uh, either um, in, in several different guises. They sell an enterprise version. They sell kind of like you, you're running your own single installation of it, you know, not across your enterprise. They're both just as equally susceptible to this problem. And it's been in there since um, version seven, and it's up to like 8.8, 8.5 or 8.3 actually, sorry. And uh, it's been a problem for quite a while and it is now being exploited in the wild. That's That was the Atlassian one, which is uh, Bitbucket. And um, all of the Git repositories hosted on, on software behind a Bitbucket service. The second one is an exploit for Microsoft's uh, ubiquitous uh, service Exchange, exchange server uh, exchange. Sucks. Yeah, this is obviously exchange. If you're still running uh, on premise has, exchange. Two of them. Stop. Yeah, there's there's two significant patches. I didn't fully read this one because I thought Jeremy would be more familiar with it. Honestly, uh, a little um, bit. Yeah, but yeah, this is a must patch situation. Go ahead, Jeremy. Go ahead. Yeah. So th this is this is a lovely one, which is pretty much only hitting people that refuse to migrate exchange server off of premises, uh, and it, it's because it's a server site. Uh, so if you're hosting it, you're the one who's having the problem. Uh, if you're getting Microsoft to do it, well, it's their problem and you can scream and yell at them for, well, you know, all the good it's gonna do you. It's been very limited uh, in what's been coming out, but the problem is that once they sort of get in, uh, they've got some ridiculously nasty attachments um, to exchange and because exchange has to be connected to the internet it's not like you can put it behind a firewall or you know try and take it down for a little bit it's like no you you have to patch this immediately and the fun thing with exchange is often you've got a bunch of downstream servers so uh, yeah you patch your main one but a bunch of the other ones don't get patched and because it's not that hard to tell what your infrastructure looks like through some other wonderful bugs. They can just sort of go down the line until they find the one that hasn't been patched yet, and away you go. Now, so, yeah, the difference, long story is, short. 
don't host Exchange locally. The, but God. the difference between these two, even though they're in the same article, is that Lassian actually has a patch going on. As far as I know, Microsoft has only talked through a mitigation of these Correct. using your using URL uh, sniffing and filtering, which is a little bit too. Yeah. Uh, they, they're saying it's a little bit too tight on the um, the exact layout of the URL, and there might be a way to kind of get around that filter or spoof that. Still, they're not even patching this one yet, so well, they're they, just there is recommending a mitigation. You need to apply the patch okay. and the mitigation because there okay. is like okay. a patch, but it's actually one you should have already bloody well put on there, uh, uh, which it was using to take advantage of. And even though you've patched, it can still do it. In theory, if you filter out some of these, uh, some of the, if you do the URL, it can probably do it. But you're also going to have a yeah. bunch of people screaming that their email isn't coming in as fast as it used to because you're bloody well sniffing it now. Yeah, because there's like a there's like they have a reg, regex that they're setting up to say yeah. if it looks like this, then it's it's an, an exploit attempt. But there's probably a way around that, so <laughs> it's not good. Maybe just not even run Exchange. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> what, switch to Gmail? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there are other email servers out there. But anyway, that's a different well, story. But exchange is a little more than just your email, which is it, very the real true. fun about it. Because yeah, now I've got calendaring. all your computers. I've got all of your <laughs> uh, users. I've got yeah. a nice way into your Azure instance. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice. But see, I prefer to wait for the really, really bad ones. Like the and, Atlassian exploit, as soon as they get in, they're sniffing other problems on your network and then hopping over to those machines as well. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I prefer to wait for the 9.8s, like the, the one that we're linked to next, which is just lovely. It's called this Chaos. One's a hot mess. And yeah. oh my God, is it ever chaos? I like literally as Ars Technica's subtitle goes small office routers, free BSD machines, enterprise servers. Chaos infects them all. It don't care. You run FreeBSD, you run whatever flavor of Linux you want to, you run Windows, this bloody thing can do it. And it's relatively new, and it's growing exponentially. Uh, like, one of the ways that you do, that you check the successfulness of an infection like this is not how many systems you find that are infected, it's how many CNC servers there are. And so it's gone from 39 back in May to last week, 111. And That's so command and control. That. Yeah. So way. you're only doing that if you have the traffic that you need to be able to do it because you're constantly moving these around because the second that one person pings down an IP address and starts blocking it, you need to be able to migrate it immediately to another one. So having that many suggests that there is a significant amount of, instru- or of infections on ARM, 386, MIPS, PowerPC. It just doesn't freaking care. Uh, once it gets in, uh, it will hijack other botnets to be able to move the traffic around. Um, it goes through, of course, the, the, norm, the known uh, patches that you should have applied but didn't do it. It'll steal SSH keys. And at that point, until you've change your SSH key, H, eh, easy for me to see, uh, your SSH keys. It's It's got the keys. It don't care. It's going to keep spreading. And if you change them, well, unless it happens simultaneously, it's going to grab in there. It has a utterly terrifying amount of capabilities. Like it's not just running commands it's it'll enumerate all of the devices connected on an infected network and then fire up the remote shell afterwards and bounce it around just because it bloody well can it's they've, obviously they've written a downloadable plugin architecture for it yeah so like they're able to nuts. modify it in the field with uh new capabilities from the command and control uh systems so they're yeah. downloading new exploits as the people well people loosely described as the people behind it become more skilled and exploit other CVEs that become more apparent. This is also cross architecture. So uh, you're not safe. If you're on uh, 386, you're not uh, 386. 
I, it goes after power PC. That was my point because it's on arm. It's on, it's on i three. It ignores operating systems. I mean, I, you can't even get a good office environment to run. It's literally the most compatible piece of Windows software on the planet right now. That was, that was my <laughs> point. You, you stole it from This me. software sounds great. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, I'm like, you couldn't, couldn't, couldn't these people find a more economically feasible way of making money? I mean, how are they even making money with this? I don't even know. But I mean, don't they have, can they get a job with these skills? But, uh, <laughs> You'd think, but. Yeah, so this is utterly <laughs> terrifying. It, it's unique. Uh, this it's not borrowing off of old viruses, which you see a lot of is re- rehashing, right. you know, uh, old stuff. This is all brand new. So obviously, it's not a bunch of kids out there that have figured something out. There is serious money and brains behind this, and as of yet, it's it's still wandering around. It's still doing horrific things, and it's changing, as Brett said, so bloody quickly. You, you can't patch fast enough, let alone try and install those patches. And they're thinking that one of the exploits is like for them to run crypto mining. And I'm thinking like, still, is that what they're surely still doing that? Hmm. Well, if it's I not your was power. Passe. That was passe. I didn't think we were doing crypto yeah. mining on GPUs anymore. Not, not for no, profit. No, no, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's hacking Bitcoin wallets or, you know, taking over oh. some of the remaining... Uh, things so that you can do the 50% stake uh, hacks and the various other things. Uh, actually, one of the exploits is actually exploiting SSH save keys to in order to do system hopping once they're behind a firewall. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, mm, that's not really. why I didn't really pay attention to the Altacean one. Because no. <laughs> this ruined my week more than enough. The safest thing is just to unplug it all. Yes. Air gap, everything. Yes. Oh, no, air gap doesn't work anymore either. <laughs> Stop. You're talking about the Iranian exploits now. <laughs> no, one of them, but yeah, there's a couple others I've done. And I mean, like the, 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 the my favorite was the one where they were actually able to get data transfer information off of the blinking of a light indicating hard drive activity on a computer. That's nuts. That was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Or your router or you know, various other things. All right. Now that we've uh, make, made sure that nobody in IT sleeps this evening, let's move on mm-hmm. to picks of the week. And Josh will get us started as is tradition. Okay. You know what? Just back in the day, this would have been so awesome. $30 for a 480 gig SSD. I mean, we're approaching that nickel, nickel a gig thing. It just, the sale ends pretty quickly. And it's, you know, not a great manufacturer, but, you know, if you got somebody who has an older spinning disc, 30 bucks, half a terabyte. It's crazy. It's a great price. It's a crazy world we live in. Somebody ought to sell it to easy. Somebody Does it run your racing games better? Probably. I don't know. I would hope so. Yeah. Mm. Last gasp for SATA. Yep. Well, Going out with we a still cheap need SATA bang. for our giant hard drives for you know cold yeah. storage and stuff. But yeah. Josh, how will you plug in your CD-ROM drive without SATA? Hmm. SATA to USB. Hmm. Yeah, yep. they're so, adapters. Yes. Okay, all right. All right. Seeing as now I can't put it in the case anymore because they won't cut out a hole for it. I mean, yeah, yeah. There's, well, I mean, there's you no place to put it. Own, Get out the Dremel tool, Jeremy. Your pick. Uh, sort of related to racing, but on a much more destructive and home-built way. Uh, somebody is designing what they've referred to as the Doomba. Because, I mean, it's kind of boring just vacuuming your floors when you could hook up a flamethrower to a souped-up Roomba and yeah, drive it it around sterilizing everything. He, he's building it from the ground up. So it's it's he's designed it so it's going to fit into a Roomba casing when it's finally finished. But uh, it's got some ridiculously fast RC parts in it. Uh, there's a little video where it literally gets going so fast it tears itself apart, which, I mean, you got to love. It's already got the butane can- canister contained inside. He's just uh, waiting to figure out how to f- set up the uh, flamethrower on it so that he can have an RC 
flamethrowing device, which can spin please, at a ridiculous speed. Please, please have flamethrower in this video. Please, please, please. He hasn't hooked it up yet. Sorry. You have to imagine Damn the flamethrower. But it's Damn coming. It. Oh, well, it is in his garage. Yeah. And as you can, can see, it literally spun itself to the point it where it's kind of yeah. busted itself. Keep your eye on this because I probably want to get one eventually to so the kids in the backyard can play with it, of course. <laughs> All right, hold on a second here. Second week in a row, third week in a row, I cannot click full screen on any YouTube video. It doesn't do anything. Hmm. It's time for a reinstall. Okay. Hmm. It is. I bet you if you're running an arc, it would. You need to switch up. Yeah. Brett. All Your right. Pick. Once again, I espouse the wonderfulness that is widescreen monitors. And let's just jump right to a really good deal in an LG widescreen monitor. This is 100 hertz, maybe not the best for um, high speed gaming, but it will game. It is AMD FreeSync compatible. $199 will get you this 29 inch, 21 by 9 ultra wide. 2560 by 1080, 100 hertz IPS monitor. Nicely within a good current color gamut. RGB 100, 99% color gamut. Mm. Interesting, this does not appear to be from, curved. Huh? Not curved, but it is a 29, so you're kind of right on the edge of maybe this but should it's, be But I mean, curved. it's IPS, that's fine. You don't have to worry about the VA yeah. shift no. off axis. But it's... Yep, this may or may not have like difficulty with certain black levels and things like that. Well, it may IPS. skew it, right? It may skew more towards a utilitarian, maybe more of a work monitor than gaming. But at a hundred hertz display, you could very well game on this. What is the I mean, range? You, you said it was free sync, hundred hertz. Does it go down to forty eight? Does it go down below that? You know what? I didn't see as at as low uh, the low uh, level uh, it would, would sync to, okay. but it is AMD Free Sync compatible. I I guess right. I'll have to but that default mean to anything saying so you know what the range is. True, true, but it's difficult to say that it's Free Sync compatible it with there, at there least no one hundred twenty hertz refresh rate at minimum FHD resolution and low latency. Um, I'm pretty sure that's an overdrive. I, I think oh, hundred okay. hertz is. Okay. Mm. 100 hertz might be the safe number on this one. I but do it's like from the idea a decent ultra manufacturer. Wides, ultra wides like this for 200 bucks. I mean, this is tempting. 2560 yeah. by 1080 is easy to drive. Yes. Beautiful color you gamut. Don't, yeah. You good, could drive this panel. with an you could drive this with an Arc. Oh, yeah. Dare dare I say. Arc A770. This would be a great and at 100 hertz, you know, that's a very safe frame rate number for 770 to achieve. I mean, you saw in a lot of the charts, they were hitting 60, 70. Of course, there were the, some weird ones that were hitting 256, but you don't need those frames anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> you're not competitive gaming at a hundred Hertz display. Give me a break. Apparently this is just anyway, the new it's a, it's price. Cause there's another one here on Amazon for right around that same price from LG Ooh. 29 inch, oh. same 2560 by 1080 IPS. I, I didn't see this one. Ultra oh, it's 75 Hertz. Oh, I see. This has refresh. a little bit. Okay. Yeah, this one might have a little That's bit more. That's actually the chin. one I got my wife. Okay. Oh, this I one. Huh? I believe the so. One, the other one, the they, car, they sort the of build. <laughs> but there, it's a fantastic the other, monitor for the price. The the other one was built more of a, of a frameless display, so they tried to minimize the bezels on it. I'm not sure about this one, but anyways, that was a calling card to the other one as well. Okay, so be on the lookout for $200. LG IPS ultra wides, twenty nine inch um, ultra wides look like they're they're drifting towards that two hundred dollar mark right now. Mm-hmm. Must be they have gotten that panel manufacturing down to uh, very inexpensive a science uh, rate. Yes, a uh, science. Hmm. Uh, they have they have manufactured it to a price. <laughs> yes, <laughs> fair point. <laughs> <laughs> this. This is probably a trend that will keep on growing and they'll keep on getting less and less expensive. And, and then the next trend will be the OLED gaming yeah. monitors just everywhere. Because mm. LG, allegedly, this is a couple days ago at Flat Panels HD report, LG Display will soon, will soon start production of 27 and 32-inch OLED panels. 
when they start making those in large quantities, they're going to get cheaper and cheaper. Mm-hmm. A year in, a year in, once those start to hit. But yeah. But, uh, you know, the uh, component shortages pushed up my favorite, which is the 34 inch 1500R curved, uh, you know, 1440p display, 3440, 1440 mm-hmm. display. That's kind of one of my favorite monitors right now. That price was sort of drifting towards that three hundred dollar range, but now they're up in the mid threes, to pushing four hundred again. I, I blame component shortages and shipping and stuff like that. And mm. Mm. damn monetary pressures. Driver. Is thirty four forty by fourteen forty high refresh the new four K? Is that for I, for a PC gamer? I, I see a I lot like of ultra wides oh. on people's desks. Yeah. I thought 16K was the new 4K. No, Whatever. well, 8K <laughs> technically 8K. is the new 4K, but 16K becomes the new 8K. No, I, I think you've got a I think you've got an interesting point there to say is the is the new the new monitor and refresh rate to aspire to 3440, 1440, at least 144. So how do you differentiate um, that, from the living room experience? Everybody's got a 4K TV now. You can it's hard to mm-hmm. buy anything that's not a 4K TV unless it's really, really small. So I, I like the of the of the widescreen though 3440 by 1440 it's it's unique to the pc gaming experience there you go exactly yeah yep, which is why it. i've been exclusively testing at that resolution uh as i prepare for the 4090 ah. mm. Mm. nice i Wait. think you're onto something do i really want to test 2560 by 1440 again for the 10th Man, year someone else is doing that now Exactly. Differentiate mm-hmm. ourselves. Piss people off. Offer less. No 1080 results. No 4K That's results. Hey, real quick, can you pull up the Steam hardware survey? Let's see where we're at here. No, oh, brother. No, uh, it's just still <laughs> going to be 1080. What, what are, are, are the well, I mean, it is uh, stocking their hardware it, with these it's, days? I I completely agree, Jeremy. It's, it's going to be there, but I just want to see where 3440, 1440 is falling. <sighs> Nowadays, where where's Less the rest of it? I bet. Uh, What's I'm the looking item for it now? Here? Looking at re- we need resolution. Resolution. Primary display resolution. There we go. You know, 1080 is taking a hit. It used to be 80. percent We're down to 66. percent That says ah, it's welcome points. to Mister not appearing on this uh, chart. It's oh, there so it is. Stupid high. Twenty five forty. Hey, the widescreen experience is is three percent, not even two percent. Hey, well, no, look, it's three. Four, it's three. But look at this. Look at this. Four K, only two point four six percent. Yeah, and put together the two widescreen experiences: twenty five sixty ten eighty and okay. thirty four forty fourteen. Just to clarify, oh. <clears throat> he's using just to clarify, you do mean ultra wide? I do. Not just I mean ultra wide. I mean ultra wide. The ultra wide experience experience actually outnumbers 4K. Yeah, so it's whether you're getting the 3440 by 1440 or the less expensive 2560 by 1080. When you're going with one of those, you're slightly below 4K actually. Okay, but yeah. it's right. It's close. It's like two it's, and a half percent of the market, and then another 2.4 percent of the market. Yeah, it's not a lot, but it's. Uh, it's interesting because the 2560 by 1440 to me has just become sort of the default monitor resolution. If you're buying a monitor over a certain size, True. Th- they're so inexpensive. Why wouldn't yeah. you get the 1440? Get mm-hmm. the extra screen real estate for you know productivity. Pennies. Yeah. Yep. Oh, they, the, they noticed the, that I took my 1680 by 1050 play. down. Here, there's a big flaw with this, though, because they're not differentiating between an internal display to a laptop and an external display. Oh. Yeah, and yeah. there's a lot of laptops at 1080p, and there's a, there's obviously a lot of laptops at 1366 by 768 because that's five and a half percent of the entire Steam user base. Yeah. And then 1440 by, 19, by 900, that's laptop. Come on. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, I love the uh, so- <laughs> 24 by 768 is still measurable. <laughs> it's still about a quarter percent of all. Steam Almost as many as the 720p oh. guys. Those poor, poor, poor people. I mean, um, those awesome people, those are CRT gamers. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. You're right. I take it back. I, I withdraw my poor, poor person comment. 
There's um somebody on YouTube who is uh, saying, "Is this below ten cent per pixel?" <laughs> oh, good question. <laughs> nice. Yes, I haven't. I haven't done the math on this, but it's a good question. Oh yeah, it's, it's way a lower. Legitimate question. Way lower. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's look at Arc's impact on the Steam hardware survey, shall we? So at the top, right. the 1060, of course, it will always be of at course. the top for probably the next yeah. Rain decade. supreme forever till those chips burn, burn, burn. And then, so that's about 7% of the market, followed by the 1650 and the 2060. And then you go, let's see, one, two, like a dozen NVIDIA cards. And then you get your first AMD Radeon graphics with no uh, what specific... Is that? It's like internal. Uh, it's laptops. an IGP or something. Yeah, it's, it's a laptop. GPU. Yikes. It's a laptop. And then you have Iris oh, Z. XE, <clears throat> Intel UHD. Man, a lot of people must have upgraded their laptops. If XE outnumbers UHD, no, it doesn't. Yeah. Wow, no, no, it? no. Wait, it oh, it's on it the doesn't. rise. Look at that. It's on the rise. Ooh. Yeah. People are buying. People are buying. And here we have the 580 at 1.4. Nine percent. Oh no, it's down to one point one nine. I'm looking at old results. Well, here. That's from May to September, look at this drop. There's a lot of change I mean, I going on said, there. I would have said the five eighty was a, also a never die, but you now that's. Dying, I mean, hey, one point one nine percent of people agree with you, Brett. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's the four eighty. Let's I combine. Can, it's those. amazing. The fifty seven hundred XT sits at zero point six two percent. Not still out doing the six twenty. This is ridiculous. Uh, 6600 XT is at 0.37%. I, Has anybody looked at any charts? Like the 6600 XT should be way up there because it's the yeah, nice yeah, performance it's, of that it's, chip it's, is fantastic. It is, it well is the darling the darling dollar per frame. It's this this is such a weird skewed look at computer hardware. Well, but the thing is that's what people are doing. Is it? And and what do we have? What else? Where else can we look for this sort of data? It's the people who agree to the Steam hardware survey exactly. that are exactly. doing it. So yeah, that is a, a biased sample, but still fairly large. You're right about that. I always click yes because I want to be counted. Yeah, but you're like a <laughs> yeah. team green Intel CPU guy, aren't you? You know what? I don't want you, you. <laughs> 1080 Ti <laughs> guy. Okay. Let's what, end what's this wrong show. with the 1080 Ti? Let's end it, please. <laughs> Josh, Please. Can, you, can you end it for us? Oh, Lord. it's It's been a long time coming, but now it's finally the end. We've we've talked and we've talked and we've talked and we may even have bickered. But in the end, it it is worth it to someone out there. And if you're listening this far, then obviously it was you. So congratulations, 2006 Time Person of the Year. Good call back. Long distance dedication. Hmm. All right. Thank you. <sighs> Slow clap. Slow clap. I'd I forgotten remember, about that magazine. Was it, wasn't it an AMD executive or somebody at AMD was complaining that the Steam hardware survey was skewed towards Intel and NVIDIA because of uh, cafes? Like it's every time you log out in the oh, yeah, new long user, time ago. it counts it again. I guess they said that they made some tweaks to the algorithm. It doesn't happen again. Seven Smith, that's just rude. 2006, the last time Josh had hair on his head. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, actually, that's it was not, well before. That's not that. fair. That's not fair. Yeah. I, I, I did not have hair on my head in 2006. Got rid of it in. <laughs> let me guess. Let me guess. 1986. No, oh, 99. Okay. Because here's I'm what happened. To shaving it off. Here's the right. Here's the true story. Josh watched Star Trek: The Next Generation for the first time. He saw Patrick oh. Stewart. He saw his presence. He saw basically oh, yeah. the creation of the new prototype for what it meant to be a leader, a, a true captain. And, and he said, and "Stage, I am stage." Yes. I was going to say, you're assuming that Josh has never watched any of his stage performances. Mm, what we need what saying. is a climbing song. <laughs> <laughs> Well, or that one too. I was going King Lear, but hey. <laughs> that was great. Is this the after show? Is this the after yeah, show? Yeah, we're after show. Yes. All righty then. <laughs>